So it is my extreme pleasure to introduce you to the first outlaw and icon, David Schwartz. He is, David is a creative partner at Hush, he is a co-founder of Hush, and he really believes in the power of saying yes. Um, I'm gonna walk around a little bit, because I'm nervous. Uh, so, everything it says in your handout, I'm not doing, because I wrote that about a month ago, um, as you know. And my title's super boring, but I hope this isn't. So I beg of you 20 minutes and change of just focus. Uh, I promise to show you a lot of fun stuff. I'm uh, one of the founders of Hush, as Deanna mentioned. Uh, we're based here in New York. We're a design agency. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that and what that means to me. Because I have a feeling, even though we use the same words, it means something different to you. And I want to explore that a little bit. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to tell you about Hush for a second. I'm going to talk about what I think Risk Taker is. I'm going to talk about this weird, quirky relationship between risk and failure. I'm going to get into something that's core to our firm, which is experimentation, which I haven't heard a lot of today. And I'm going to beg that you fail bigger than you're doing now. Um, I'm gonna flip it and figure out how we can get paid to fail, and then I'm gonna be done. <laughs> um, okay, so we're an experienced design agency, and we work at this kind of weird, nascent, but not uh, area where physical space and digital things, tools, surfaces, canvases, interactions, technologies work together. Now, some of you are sitting there going, oh, like, he, does, he hangs screens on walls. And some of you are sitting there going, oh yeah, he's like an architecture firm that has like an IT department. And some of you guys are going, oh no, it's, um, it's like a digital agency, but like they have an architect on staff or something. Um, it's okay, it's painful, this world of nomenclature and uh, impossible things to describe. So showing is a lot better than telling, and fortunately we're pretty good at that. So uh, we do work for big companies, so like big real estate developers, Starkitects. Um, we did some work with Zaha Hadid and related to bring Zaha's artistry and the beauty of what she makes to an experience that people could kind of tap into that vision, tap into her as an artist, as an architect. So there's permanent kind of spaces like this. Um, we do work in retail where you know, the cliche ideas, immersive retail, experiential retail, things that drive customers uh, to retail, to brick and mortar, because they have an experience there that they can't replicate uh, in e-commerce or online tools. Um, we work with a lot of sports brands, Nikes and Adidas's and Equinox's, and in this case, we've built a digital gaming platform for Equinox, in which 40 strangers show up to a class to sweat together and are somehow put in these crazy positions through digital tools, visualizations, data, in which they're somehow competitive and then somehow collaborative. And by the end, they're high-fiving with strangers and they kind of want to beat that guy in the corner because they didn't like the way they overtook, you know. So the gamesmanship of fitness. So we build those spaces, build the game theory and thinking about how human beings actually psychologically game and how that has physiological outputs. Those are just a few, but what we believe in, because someone earlier on the stage said there's a big difference between what you do and what you believe in, and I really believe that. Um, I believe in beauty, I believe in humanity, I believe in simplicity and directness. I believe in taking big complex ideas for brands, what they stand for, what their missions are, what their employees believe, what they want to tell their customers, what the products they are uh, make. And I like to tell them in the most simple, direct, clear way possible. If we could build spaces and experiences that you simply entered and understood in a very empathetic way what a brand was trying to say or express, what its vision is, we would do that. So simplicity is our friend. We try to minimize and minimalize everything. That's just part of our vision. We think that's better. 
So, so that's kind of a little bit about us. There's a lot more to tell. I'm gonna show you two kind of projects that never finished, or they never saw the light of the day, really. But I think they have value. Um, so let's talk about risk. Um, I stayed on theme. I'm gonna do risk, but when I heard this was the theme, I actually kind of wasn't, I was skeptical is the words. I was skeptical. Um, risk is kind of like air in our industry. Um, it's everywhere. We all know it. We all breathe every day. But talking about it is almost like talking about air. It just is. But as I researched and kind of just studied risk and looked at people who I thought had interesting takes on risk in their own businesses, it really started to unfold for me. But as a small business owner, you know, we're a small agency working for Fortune 500 clients, I live risk. I go home every day with risk. It's just, you know, risk is in everything. It's in the finances, it's in the creative concept, it's in your team, it's in your staffing, it's in your liability, your relationships, your contracts, it's all over the place. So to not be okay with it would be a death sentence. So being okay with a level of risk is sort of just par for the course for everyone in this room, I bet, too. So, like, loosen your right shoulder up a little bit, because I'm going to ask you to raise a hand. Who has felt significant risk to successfully performing your job this year? This month? You can put them down if it's not true. This week? Today? Today's easy, come on. <laughs> um, Okay, so everyone, I mean, I covered everyone. And most people at least have had it this week even. So we can say, would you all agree that you face significant risk every day or week in your job? Okay. Um, but risk and failure, and how are they related? By a show of hands, who feels like they're likely going to fail at their job? So you are literally gonna walk into your job tomorrow or next week or next month and fail. Likely, like likely, like I don't know what percentage that is, but that's like a lot of percentage. <laughs> Anyone? We got one, two, three. Okay, don't be embarrassed. Even if your boss is here. <laughs> <laughs> that's scary. Um, so, so okay. So, can we agree that there's a strange relationship between risk and failure? Because risk is something that we can tolerate or experience kind of every day, but failure is binary. Failure is like, I'm gonna walk in and drop the ball. I'm not gonna deliver. Uh, the elevator that's supposed to hold 10 people can't hold 10, it can only hold eight, and it dropped and everyone's dead. These are binary failures, right? Um, I don't agree, I'm just setting up a preconception that I think I kind of started to peel apart a little bit. So, so keep that in mind. So I think risk is sort of, made up of a few things, fear, which is obvious, probability, which is like, it's not really gonna happen, I'm not really gonna think about it, right? There's a risk of crashing in a plane, doesn't happen that often, don't think about it. And then there's preparation, which is an active state, right? Fear, probability are kind of like inert. So, who's this, anyone? Great. Babe Ruth. Anyone know his lifetime batting average? Guess. 340, who said that? Great. 342. So 342, I'm no mathematician, but I'm pretty sure that 342 means just about two out of the three times he gets at bat, he fails. Right? That's the definition. And he's Hall of Fame, and 342 is pretty average Hall of Fame. Like, that's what it is. You can't achieve better than this, more or less. So Babe Ruth worked in an industry where failure was the norm, not the exception. Pretty weird, right? You know, and he said also lots of cruel stuff, but you know, he said something, never let the fear of striking or get in your way. Not that interesting a quote, not nearly as interesting as Yogi Berra and that kind of stuff, but it's basically a quote on probability, right? It's, it's never let the 
66, the weight of 66% of the time failure stop you from doing something. That's weird, because we don't work in that industry, right? You wouldn't take the job you have now if you knew you were gonna fail two out of three times, I bet. It's not normal. Imagine going to work expecting to fail. Who's this? This one's harder. Somebody, anyone? I, I, I didn't know who it was, so. Um, this guy is Henry Marsh. He's a British neurosurgeon, probably one of the most famous movie about him. I only know about him because I caught an NPR podcast where Terry Gross was talking to him, and I was totally riveted. You have to listen to this podcast. He spends the first two minutes of his podcast reading of the book he wrote that's a memoir about brain surgery, and it's crazy. Talk about risk. This guy... The odds of Babe Ruth far exceed this guy's odds. He fails 85% of the time, and his failures are disastrous. His failures leave people in comatose states forever. That's real jeopardy. He said, some of my operations are great triumphs and tremendous, but they're only triumphs because they're also disasters. He's vocal about the disastrous effects of his failures. And he's actually embracing the fact that if they were all simple, it wouldn't be interesting and it wouldn't be valuable. So I've shown you two people who operate in industries with percentages, probabilities, and emotions that far outweigh anything you and I do. How does that feel? Awesome, right? We're off the hook. So for my firm, for Hush, we are engaged to do inherently risky endeavors. We don't really do that much commodity stuff. Frankly, as a business owner, we should probably do way more commodity stuff. Um, we often get that like thing that's like, hey, we want to do something that kind of we've never ever done before. And you know, you've heard, you've gotten that brief, um, which is great, but it's also a lot of pressure. So, back to this matrix: fear, probability, preparation. I talked about fear a little bit or perceived fear, I talked about probability in sports and medicine. Um, the, the smart thing really though is to focus this conversation on preparation. And preparation could be a bunch of rules and homework and this is how we do it, but that's not really interesting either. What's actually interesting is experimentation because experimentation is actually a form of preparation, you just don't know where you're going yet. Would you say it's a fair the definition of it? Preparation, you have a goal, you're preparing for the at-bat, you're preparing for uh, the big conversation, you're preparing for a, a speech. Um, experimentation, you're more like improvising in music. You're just doing things to see what the outcome is because you can, because you want to learn, because you don't know where the end is. That's a beautiful thing. If you can build that into your organization, your culture, it solves all sorts of risk factors and failure problems. So I want to talk a little bit about experimentation because we build it into the, what we do. We don't have a lab in the corner, in the basement, with dark lights and people tinkering away. It's just part of what we do. We get paid to do it. We do it as part of our everyday. That's just how we behave. And by not subjugating it as something else, it has to be infectious in your organization. So the first experiment I want to show you is something from about a year and a half ago. Um, I love this project. I love it because it's so goddamn simple. And it was at the end of a year, the start of a new year, and I challenged my team to express what our company is about through our data, through the metrics of what we did in that year. And I challenged them to say, you're all designers, you're all creative thinkers, you all make things from nothing. You give form and visual and sound and shape to things. Can you alter the design process, the traditional design process, with this challenge? And so um, this is data. This is ugly. It's our data. It's boring. Data is boring. Everyone knows that, right? Data often looks like this when you graph it. Data is boring. It's bar charts. It's gross. 
So we had the gross stuff, and I started to challenge the team about how to make it not gross and make it interesting. And so what they started to do was look at how to plot data, how to build data in visual ways that makes intrinsic, simple, direct sense, back to what my big yellow slide was about us liking beauty and simplicity and directness. And they started to do it. And they started to give it form. And they started to make it understandable. And they started to build uh, software that could take our data in real time and do interesting things with it to evoke the sort of year we had, and so on and so forth. And so we're, we're pushing data into these little custom software programs we're making, and they're making shapes. And why are they making shapes? Well, they're making shapes bounded by constraints that we've created as designers. And then we looked at that time and the data over time, and we created more and more of these things that all had meaning just in their pure shape. And then we translated those digital shapes that came from digital data, that came from physical human activity, and translated into physical materials and shapes. And then we built some stuff. And ultimately, what we ended up building, after many, many micro failures and restarts and throwing stuff out over about six, seven weeks, we built this cool sculpture that we called Made by Numbers. And it's our whole year, it's our company, as a physical form in which we didn't take any subjective license other than what we had to to craft it, but what it stands for is every behavioral change that created data that showed how our company operated over the course of 12 months. We even translated that physical form and the data into sonic outputs. We built software that took each of the weeks of that data and tuned it into a, an audio signature that you can actually play. So here's a little wrap up. It's, it's tidier than what I just said. Case study film makes everything look pretty. It's not that pretty, right? We failed on these eight things multiple times over that, that project. We wrote the wrong software. We used the wrong technology. We captured the wrong data. We missed data. Um, we botched the process. We actually fabricated something with the wrong material and spent a lot of money having to refabricate. There's a lot of failure baked into that. Um, but those micro failures are muscle strengtheners, right? Failures create knowledge, that's interesting. So why are we so scared of failing? If we know failure creates knowledge, why are we so scared of failing? 
So we fail small, that's cool. How do we fail big? Because that sounds more interesting. Um, what's ironic is these internal experimentation projects, part of risk, part of failure, um, were four for four on going from small risk, small failure projects internally to big projects externally. So I don't know, that's a great batting average. That's about a thousand. Um, so an unnamed financial institution came to us based on the project I just showed you, which cost us $15,000, took us four weeks of moonlight time. We did it for ourselves, just for the hell of it, just to experiment, just to learn. And they wanted to pay us a lot of money to figure something else out, which sounded a lot like what we were figuring out for ourselves. So this, this company trades 70% of E-Trade's data in the world every day. They hire MIT um, data scientists and computer scientists. They write their own algorithms. They trade micro alpha. They make billions of dollars based on small changes in the market. Um, and, at, and they do that at scale. And that is the DNA of their company. And so we think about, the way I think you guys think about themed entertainment, I'm generalizing, sorry. The way some of you are, I'm understanding, you speak about themed entertainment, I think about brand. So I'm like a brand person. So this company is made of people who think about numbers and trading and algorithms and science and the butterfly effect of financial markets and micro and macro. That's what they think about every day to do their job. So how do we create something for a giant headquarters space that exudes that every day, like their North Star? so we can express their brand through data. And so we had this three floor space with a, a cut through and, we, and, and it was all being done and we had to figure out what we're gonna do in this thing to be everything that this brand stands for. And so we analyzed um, the space and we looked at these key moments and we found this big three triple height space to make a giant gesture in and it was going to be amazing and we, figured out that through experimentation and referencing that old project and looking at data for our company, which is so tiny and, piece and simple, but that idea was the DNA of a much larger idea. It could be scaled infinitely. Our company's small, this company's larger. There's lots of other things bigger than that, but the idea can scale. And so we figured out that small little changes in the marketplace have big macro effects and that's a rallying cry for people working in the market that they wanna have a voice, they wanna do things that change the economy, that generate value for their clients, et cetera. We got super nerdy, I won't bore you with the details, but we nerded out on financial algorithms. I know everything about what these guys do, it's crazy. And we built a structure and a system through design that made sense. And then we realized that, oh, things move at different paces in the financial markets. Algorithms have different behaviors. There's a lot of responsiveness to different behaviors on the micro and macro level. There's a whole system to this, and we can play with that system on something very simple. And the way we move and populate a system might indicate what's happening in the markets at any given time in a beautiful, clear, direct way, human way. So ultimately, we designed this which was essentially a two and a half story data sculpture whose existence was to remind the employees and the company of what their brand is all about. That data is a persistent element in their brand and that data is always changing and that they have the power to harness that data and do good and drive value. So, you know, I won't bore you with renders, but cool. But you see the through line between our experiment and this. It's a different form, same concept. We'd never get here without the micro failures of our experimentation. <coughs> and so on and so forth. And you really see how, I mean, we just played and played with using algorithms and data and movement and how that reflects what they do. And we understood it as not just digital inputs and algorithms that we could harness and then display, but also lighting, material, space, volume, brand signature, right? So now you're starting to understand how we think about brand, right? This intersection of these things. And it goes on 
and on. I could stare at these things all day because they're just cool. But I mean, you know, you start to think about the psychology of this, right? You're working in an environment. If the markets are going crazy, do I want to be, does I want this to be a reflection of the crazy or do I actually want it to be a psychological offset? Do I want it to actually calm down and be the opposite? There's really interesting just like um, psychological perception ideas we're exploring to figure out what would be best. And so, so this is the, the thing that we engineered into future phases. And then as some things happen, dead. Dead. Techni technically we failed. Technically we failed. It's not in the world, but we learned so much through this process. Now, in our client size, we didn't fail. It was a great process. It just died for a million reasons, but we technically failed. But I learned more and more and more through this project, and it all came through that initial experiment. So we very quickly connected a small risk with a large risk. So bigger risk, bigger knowledge. I have much bigger knowledge than I had after that experiment. And in fact, as luck would have it, we're putting the same concepts to use in, in a couple of other projects. So it builds on itself. So um, I would ask the room something. Do you guys think that your organization supports risk and embraces failure? Raise your hand if you think that's reasonable. Say about a third of you, maybe? It's too low. Is there a way to create opportunities to fail at scale, meaning not that big a deal, but creating space for it? So you start to train into the culture the ability to actually fail, even in micro failures? That's pretty key. Now I'm going to ask a crazy question. Do you think you can get your clients to pay for your failures? How cool would that be? Right? Can you get paid to fail? Imagine having the audacity to broadcast and telegraph to your clients that you fail a lot and you still get hired for that reason. Do you think that's possible? Anyone? Who wrote these tweets? Yes. Elon Musk, everyone knows Elon Musk. You probably also know or saw it on social media when his rockets either landed and crashed and blew up or tried to take off and blew up. He has systematically gotten paid to fail. Now, he's leveraging a lot of his own money. He's got a lot of venture capital. They're financing him to fail. He's had a lot of successes for sure, but he fails repeatedly. And by the way, both of these tweets were tweeted 30 seconds after the incident. So he has high twitch muscle reaction to failure. These aren't, you know, overly PR'd, you know, wordsmith tweets where like, hey, was that, is this cool? Is, what is this suggesting to our shareholders? No, this was from the hip, he's shooting this kind of laughing at failure. Millions and millions of dollars of failure, by the way. So it's possible. It's possible to get paid to fail or be valued to fail. So I would say, let's not run away from risk. Let's figure out a way to embrace it, to make failure a knowledge generator and get paid to fail. If sports heroes can do it, if industry and technology leaders can do it, if leaders in medicine can do it, and if future leaders of nations can do it, <laughs> why can't we, right? So let's focus on risk, create failure, and be proud of that. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Incredible. Thank you, David. So uh, before we take a break, we're actually going to take questions for David. So if anyone has any questions, uh, we'll run the mic to you. And if you would just get us, give us a moment to get the mic to you. Yeah, 
You said recently that uh, working with data wasn't something that, or at least I understood it this way, wasn't something that you always did, right? That it was more of a recent phenomenon. So can you talk a little bit about, more about how that's influenced other projects or just internal processes as well? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we ha we've worked with data for a while, but um, I think there's a difference between like data visualization and things like that, which we all know, we see it's become kind of, you know, my mom knows what that is. Um, but but uh, I, would say, I would say looking at like data and then being able to transform it into something in new shapes, new forms, things that aren't expected, that's really interesting to me, and that's something we continue to prove out, and people keep starting to ask for. Um, we're by far not data scientists where <coughs> we don't understand data any better than any of you do. We're, you know, we're lay people when it comes to data, but we are designers, right? So we see the potential of raw material really well, and I am particularly super psyched about what data and software is doing with design, and um, design to me has always been a little bit about this, um, you know, this uh, aesthetic kind of like, like highbrow thing, you know, modernist thing, and it's you have to know the right typeface and the right graphic layout, and it's very uh, you know intellectual, which I appreciate, but it's kind of a little snooty, and I think data represents like a way around that. It almost represents like a hands-off approach to design. Like the data is the data. Maybe you just corral it a little bit, and the output is, is the output, and you have to be okay with that. I don't know if any of you know Saul LeWitt, the artist. Saul LeWitt, for me, is like the, the, um, the first data artist, right? He wrote programs called instructions to be played out by computers called gallery assistants who made his art by a bunch of rules. That's just a software app. It's just a program. So his work has really influenced the kind of way I perceive data in design, which is like rigorous and, and objective in a way. That's a long answer. Sorry. <laughs> That's great. Other questions for, for David? I see there's one right here in the front, actually. A red shirt. In speaking to your clients during pitches proposal phase, before you've secured a contract, are you building in this process of experimentation and informing the client there's going to be failures along the road? Is we're going to build to the thing that you want? We're going to get there. In other words, are you, you know, developing their tolerance for this risk failure experimentation? It's a great question. Um, the political hat on, I would say, like, yeah, we've, you know, we TM'd the process of failure, and everyone, you know, <laughs> the truth is, it's it's about being honest, and I think. Um, the honesty in not knowing what we're doing, but knowing we know how to get there, which someone else said on the stage as well, is the thing. So we don't pitch that often. Um, we should probably more so I could make more money. But um, we, we, we propose a lot, right? Which is like, we've done all this stuff, we have all this knowledge. You know we're gonna get there. We always get there, somehow but you have to go with us because we may zig and zag. You can't have the thing that's never been done because it's never been done, and we have no proof of that. So it's this chicken egg thing. So it's just about, I think, an honesty and open sourcing of this is how we see the world, this is how we see our process, are you ready to do this? And sometimes it works great and sometimes it doesn't. But you know, it's part of the client selection thing. It's like, do you, are you vibing with someone who can, whose organization can deal with that? Some organizations just can't deal with that, and that's, that's okay. Probably not a great partner for us, though. Fantastic. I see a question in the back. <coughs> Excuse me. OK. Hey, thanks. Uh, can you give an example or, or maybe give some insight as to how to tell uh, when you're dealing with an organization that maybe is much, uh, much less or much more risk averse? Uh, so that you can you don't spend time you know trying to sell meat to a vegan. <laughs> I'm gonna steal that. That's great. <laughs> um, yeah, if a procurement person calls you, don't answer. <laughs> Seriously, it just doesn't work. You can't hire creative firms through procurement. It just doesn't work. 
Creativity is about people and, and, and relationship and understanding that you're trusting the people's brains you're buying. And if you don't have a one-to-one -one connection with the buyer, and it's through an intermediary, a third party, or there's no dialogue allowed, or Jesus, how many people in this room have had those procurement things where you have to like send questions in and then they like white label it all and put it in like a spreadsheet of answers and stuff. Oh my God, <sighs> nauseous. <coughs> um, so that never works. I've never won a procurement led job in my whole life, ever. So that's pretty bad odds, right? Worse than baseball, worse than neurosurgery. So that's one. I mean, the other stuff is I think just like you open source your process of what happens and what things go on at what time and you watch the reactions. And our, our process is absolutely normal. It's stuff everyone here understands. It's phasing and things like that. But you really understand that people have to be a little bit intrepid to step off the cliff, so to speak, and know that there's a few stairs there to walk, but the staircase isn't built yet. Um, and that's it. And that's also all about you know, it starts before that, actually. It starts by knowing who you want to be your client. And we did a whole thing this year, or last year, about like strategic alignment, where we really dug into our own business and looked at who we worked with and, and, who, and when it worked really well and when it didn't work really well and why. And of course, there's anomalies, but when you really look at the, the broad bell curve of clients that you work with, ours were like almost always on this innovation curve. I'm sure you guys have seen, heard about this weird innovation curve of, of companies, and they were always in a, in, a, in a sprint or a growth moment where they felt funded, uh, intrepid, innovative. Um, they had the capital to capitalize on those emotions and those feelings, and they were investment-centric, and they had long, long-term goals and big stretch goals. Um, the companies we aligned with that were kind of coming off of that or too nascent in their trajectory to not be able to support that weren't great partners for us. So, it starts before you get the RFP. It's like, who do you want to be with, you know? All right, we're going to wrap up just because I think David and I are in are between you and, and dessert right now. So, thank, if we could thank David again one more time, that'd be fantastic. Thank you.